The Town Council will hear a report on the environmental impact of salt used in our winter operations, the methods we currently use to minimize salt applications, and possible strategies for further reductions. I will turn it over to the Public Works Department. Director Astor, are you leading this one? No. Okay. Thanks for making time for this Absolutely. presentation. We'll be short. My name is Sandy Stott, and I'm chair of the Conservation Commission and a member of the Muirbrook Steering Committee. I'm here with Josh Katz and Jay Astle. Last year, responding to a number of queries from neighbors about salt use on our roads and watersheds, I wrote about it in my monthly column on public lands in the Times Record. I had more questions than answers. That column brought me a note from Josh Katz, hydrogeologist and former Maine Department of Transportation salt educator, and Josh suggested that we meet with our public works director, Jay Astle, to understand his take on salt use. Jay met with us and filled us in on the town's efforts to make the roads safe and reduce salt use, both for environmental and financial reasons. We found ourselves like-minded and agreed to work together to advance our hopes of getting salt use in Brunswick right. There's not a day in the winter we don't think about this, Jay told us. Encouraged by recent council attention to watershed issues, our hope tonight is to inform council of our efforts with salt and to use this appearance as a springboard for a broader effort at public education about salt use and safety. Late in 2022, Josh and Jay gave a salt workshop to the Conservation Commission, and this gave us a chance to include our town's new environmental planner, Ashley Charlson, in our work. The four of us met again last week. Josh and Jay will offer you a shortened version of this workshop and answer questions as they may arise. Thank you. Good evening, Council. I admire your endurance for sitting through these meetings. I know We're I, not I, done yet. I couldn't do it. Uh, so I, I worked for DOT for 24 years. Uh, th there's a state law that says if a uh, government entity damages a water supply, a private water supply, that entity is responsible for correcting the problem. So the DOT had a position, the supervisor of well claims, uh, that was me. Uh, what I'm going to do today, and, 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 and the main lesson I learned there, and, and that's why I'm here today, is that salt is really very hard to mitigate if you get it into the groundwater and you get it in your water supply. It's harder to treat salt-contaminated water than it is water with oil or, or gas in it. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief history of the use of salt, the environmental impacts, and then uh, how to reduce the use. I'm going to really let Jay put the, the meat on those bones. Uh, and, and I'm going to start with my conclusion, uh, because it, it's really the, the crux of solving this whole problem, is that safe driving is possible on bad roads if you drive at the appropriate speed slow down and we don't need nearly so much salt. That'll be good for the environment, good for the, the town budget, et cetera. So anyway, you know, we've been dealing with salt ever since we've been living, uh, with snow ever since we've been living here. Early pictures show horse-drawn rollers being pulled to flatten it down. Then I've seen pictures with the guys standing in the back of the truck throwing the sand out. You know, and Jay's going to describe some of the modern equipment that we have now, which is really uh, helping to do a better job. Uh, basically, uh, in terms of uh, winter road maintenance, the old way is, was de-icing. It would sand, we would plow, uh, I'm sorry, it would snow, get a couple of inches, you'd go out with the plow. Uh, at the end of the storm, you might put down a, uh, what's called the hot load. It was sand with a little bit of salt. Uh, and in, in the end, you, you, at the end of the year, you'd wind up having a lot of uh, sand left over in ditches. Uh, there'd be dust problems with, in urban areas. Uh, and, and so there, there were some environmental, hist environmental problems using sand. Uh, 
And so uh, around 20 years ago, the concept of anti-icing started to be developed. And that, that's the, and, and it's also known as salt priority. It's probably a, a her phrase you've heard. Uh, but the idea is that you put the salt down before the snow can form a bond with the road. And uh, it allows for a much uh, easier travel earlier in the storm, a higher level of service. And the uh, public, over time, ha has come to, I don't know if it's the chicken or the egg, you know, but the, the uh, road agencies have provided better service and so the public has come to expect bare roads sooner. And, and so we've gotten into this trap of, of really keeping our roads so that we can drive at our normal speeds no matter what's going on outside. Uh, so again, uh, if we slow down, we, we could use, have a lower level of service. Uh, in terms of environmental impacts, well, with the sand, we had sedimentation, dust. Uh, sand would have to get picked up every year, and, and, and there were a lot of uh, costs associated with it. Uh, salt, when we're talking about salt and environmental impacts, uh, for starters, we have to realize we're dealing with sodium and chloride. When that salt dissolves, uh, the sodium and salt, uh, the sodium and chloride behave very differently. Uh, sodium uh, will, it, it, it has a uh, negative charge, it's a negative ion, so it tends to stick to the soil, uh, particularly if you have a lot of clay in the soil. Chloride goes wherever the groundwater goes, and uh, in the long term, it accumulates. Uh, now, to, to think of salt as something that's kind of a, a threat to the environment, is almost a leap of faith because we have salt on our table. We, we put it on our food. You know, it's an essential ingredient to life. And it, it's only when you get too much of it that it starts to become a problem. Well, we've only been putting salt on the roads for, you know, a, a couple of generations at most, you know, where it's taken thousands and thousands of years for our groundwater regimes to become established. Uh, now, the, the main reason I'm here to tell you the truth is, is my well. I, I have what I think of as wonderful water. I live over on Bunganuck Road. It, it's a dug well. It's about 60 feet from the road. Right now, I only have about 20 or 30 parts per million chloride. There's really no natural source uh, other than, you know, possible aerosols from the ocean. So that, it, it, the, the chloride, we do have sodium in some of our rock, and so it can occur naturally in the soil. But the chloride really only comes from putting it on the road. The drinking water standard is 250. So my water is easily passes, and I, I can't taste it. Uh, but if we keep putting the salt on, you know, I, I hope that my grandchildren, should I have them someday, might want to live in my house and use that water. And if we keep putting the salt on the road, year after year after year, it's going to creep up. You know, 50s may be okay, 70s okay, 100, it starts to taste a little funny. And once it gets into that soil, it's there. With uh, you know, the uh, surface water, you know, and, and the Conservation Commission is, is doing work on our, our urban impaired streams. Uh, chloride is part of the problem. But, but that's a, a, a cyclical problem. If we stop putting salt on the road, the, the surface water would clean up. But groundwater, it stays around. It sticks around. And if, if we keep doing it year after year at the rate we're going, you know, it's such a precious resource. You, 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 you look, look at around the state, people with, you know, the PFAS problem now. You know, there, there's uh, lots of people, you know, to, to look at your water and say, ugh, you know, that, that's, you know, it's a deep, uh, heart-rendering thing. So how do we reduce the use of salt? Uh, well, for, for starters, we, we've got to educate the public that there is a problem. Uh, and, and then 
the, the basic plan is to have a lower level of service on secondary roads, tertiary roads. You still want to maintain safety. You know, our, our main arteries, emergency facilities, you've got to do it properly. You know, you know certain areas, you know, you're just going to keep on salting. There's, you know, there, there are other chemicals that, take, that will melt ice, but they all have different environmental costs. Salt is really the, the best thing. And, and then the other piece is driver training. You know, people have to, you know, we should all be able to recognize when, if you wake up in the morning, boy, it looks like it might be a black ice day. You know, if you understand how black ice forms. And gee, the town's not going to have salt on the road. I better leave a little extra time for driving. Uh, you know, and, and we, we should be training people in, in how to drive in bad conditions rather than just making sure the conditions are good for them. So with that, I'm going to let Jay talk about some of the uh, things that hopefully we, well, I, I just want to, before Jay gets up, I uh, periodically go down Oak Ridge Road. It's a dead end, flat road. You really don't need to make much salt on that road, and it's all private wells. You know, earlier in the season, maybe last year, I would occasionally, you know, call Jay and say, gee, what's going on? Last couple of storms, you know, I, I think that we're getting better at it, you know, and, and it's a process, and hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll be really reducing our salt use, but that's the hope. Good evening. Uh, Jay Astle, Public Works Director. Um, thank you to Councillor King for helping us get this on the agenda for you folks. Um, as both Sandy and Josh mentioned, um, we've been having conversations about this for some time, and um, we talk about it all the time internally at Public Works. Um, I've worked with both Sandy and Josh in, in trying to think through kind of the processes by which we go um, and, and use salt during winter time. Um, I also have um, what feels like a million uh, small conversations with residents about salt use. Um, they're, they're not bashful about letting me know when we use too much salt. Um, Town managers often call me and ask me about um, our salt usage in town. Uh, so there's there's been a lot of conversation about it, but um, I think collaboratively we thought it was worthwhile to um, uh, maybe bring the the conversation to a to a higher level in the community, so that it wasn't just a lot of little small pocket conversations. That it's more one unified um, discussion, so that more people um, would understand the th uh, kind of the thinking by which we we use salt. Um, as Josh just um, uh, illustrated, it's, a, it's an important environmental consideration. Um, it's something that we care about uh, on that front of public works. Um, I also worry about the, the economics of, of salt use. It's an incredibly expensive um, product to use. Um, I, I think it's, it's just one of those things, again, we, we just, I feel like I'm thinking about it all the time and it just made sense, like, let's bring it kind of to the forefront. So, appreciate your time and listening to this. Um, and I'll, I'll just quickly run through uh, kind of the challenges that we have at, at Public Works um, as it relates to SALT, um, how we go about using it, and then um, Josh just sort of hinted at it a little bit of what we, what we might think about um, uh, doing in, in future winters. So this is our, um, we're in our fourth winter now of, of being salt priority, which means we don't use sand, um, it, we use salt. Um, we use salt, salt all the time. We don't use sand at all except on gravel roads. Um, we spent in 2019 close to $100,000 to um, add equipment to our primary plow trucks um, where there's um, a control console in the cab of the truck. The, uh, the driver has control over um, the application rate of salt, meaning how much salt is actually um, coming out of the, the back of the truck and actually onto the road. Um, it's a pretty robust system, um, and um, like most people know, technology, robust technology often has its, um, its easy failure points, and so we grapple with that on a daily basis. Um, and, and coming off from, I would say, half of our drivers have worked for us for 30 plus years, so they've been applying sand with a sand mentality for a long time. It takes 
um, a considerable amount of effort to um, un, uh, have them unlearn what they've been taught and relearn a completely new way of looking at things. Um, so I would say, um, if full honesty, the first year we probably struggled quite a bit with, uh, with what we were putting out on the roads. Um, the second year it got a little bit better. Last year, I, I think we took um, a, a significant step in terms of um, driver awareness of what they're putting down on the road. Um, this year, um, I, I feel like we've taken another big step. Um, we've almost eliminated uh, kind of the mechanical or equipment um, failure points where, um, you know, through no uh, fault of the operator, it's just there's something wrong with um, either the bed chain or the uh, the gate or the um, the spinner where um, too much salt is getting applied more than what what the driver thinks is being applied. Um, so I think we've done a, a really good job of, of being hyper-focused on the equipment aspect of things while at the same time trying to bring drivers along. Um, at this point, you know, every storm that we have, and it doesn't even have to be a storm, it could just be a, a very small um, dusting event where we're supposed to get, you know, like fluffy um, half inch and we end up with five inches of snow. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about it internally, hey, how are we gonna approach this? What does uh, air temperature look like, ground temperature look like? Uh, what's the next day gonna look like or the next couple of days? Is there any way we can use um, uh, the ensuing weather to our advantage, meaning if it's gonna be full sun, um, uh, mid 30s, then we use that to our advantage. Um, we talk about um, salt application rates during the storm, what's happening out on the roads, how are we using it, uh, and then on the tail end of the storm, when it's over, uh, we'll drive the roads. Um, we have 145 miles of roads in town. It takes almost a full day to drive all the roads uh, to see what the roads look like. You know, what we think happened um, is sometimes different than what actually happens on the road. So um, it's really important for us to field check kind of what we've done. Um, and we've gotten it of our 10 primary plow trucks, I would say first year, there's probably an issue with eight or nine of those 10 trucks in their application rates. Second year, probably down to six or seven. Um, this year, it's one or two. So uh, we're definitely making progress. Um, I am curious uh, if anybody's noticed, like on the roads, you know, is there, do people feel like there's still a lot of salt on the roads? Um, you know, I drive around, uh, not only in Brunswick, but everywhere I go, it's the only thing I look at. Uh, I'm not even paying attention to driving. I'm just like, is there granules of, of salt on other people's roads? And I say, hey, we don't have that, right? Like that's an indication, a clear indication of whether too much material was applied to a road. You've got rock salt, uh, it hasn't been crushed, there was too much on it, it's piled up on the side of the road um, because as cars are going over it, um, it's just getting blown to, to the edges. Um, most of the time we haven't had that this winter. Um, I don't have big piles at intersections. That was another really easy thing to pick on is, geez, look at that big mountain of salt right there. Um, you know, what happened, right? And so um, there's a lot of reconnaissance work and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it, it's there doesn't seem like there's ever gonna be an end to it. It's, it's not like a, hey, we've got there and now we, we relax. It's, it's clear it will um, always be like a daily conversation of, well, how did we do? And you know, what happened here? Um, do we have a new driver that um, was in a, in a different truck, right? Um, for the most part, our drivers have assigned trucks, but occasionally um, people are on vacation or are out for whatever reason and, and people get switched up. And um, it's, it's very much a, a touch and feel type of thing. It's kind of strange as that sound, you've got this big um, 60,000 pound vehicle and it's, it's kind of delicate right like not everybody knows how each truck works so um, uh, we're working towards again kind of making it better using less material um, for for all the reasons that that Josh has mentioned um, we we have all this equipment um, it's it is super sensitive but we're really focused on paying attention to it um, there's new technology that we're looking to imply uh, employ that will give us um, 
better, more accurate readings of material that actually was put down on the road. Right now, um, we rely on either a combination of uh, driver reports of how much material they put out, um, plus we can go manually into each vehicle and pull down that data. Um, but we're looking for an easier way to do that. Um, so we're looking to employ that soon. Um, and uh, we just, um, the fire department was getting rid of a vehicle. We've, <laughs> we've taken possession of this vehicle because um, we're gonna retrofit it with um, a, uh, a pretreatment system where we can put out um, a, a liquid brine solution, a salty um, liquid solution that, um, is calibrated to 23.4% salinity, which is kind of the optimum salinity level in liquid to get the melting um, capability that you're looking for. Um, whereas right now we put dry material out on the road and um, some of that ends up uh, always blowing off to the side of the road so you're not you're losing the benefit of it. Um, this is a way to, to really uh, drill down and say, hey look, um, this is the minimum amount of salt that we can use to apply to the roads. Um, uh, so we're looking at doing that and it would be um, done prior to a storm on certain roads, pro probably the primary um, thoroughfares, not secondary roads. Um, and then of course, uh, Josh also mentioned, um, we are looking, we've, we've talked about it a lot, we haven't quite figured out the logistics of how we would do this, um, of reducing, um, you know, having low salt, um, roads, whether it's select um, secondary or tertiary roads, um, particular areas, you know, one, one obvious one that comes to mind is the Marebrook watershed, so Meadowbrook, Parkview, um, and trying to get away with, with using less product um, through a storm. Um, I, I, again, I think we need to look a little bit deeper into how we would actually do that. Um, again, like our goal is to use as less salt as possible anyway, so it's like how do we squeeze a little bit more um, uh, out of that process to, to reduce it even further. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, this is all to say, it's a very complicated process. I used to think, oh, yeah, it's just plowing roads. Um, and, but it's like so much more than that. Um, you know, we, we're worried about storms, but then the other driver that we get is, um, I, you know, we take calls on road conditions. And as soon as we take a call, it forces our hand. You can't ignore a call. Somebody says, well, um, Rocky Hill, right? It's always slippery. <laughs> um, and it forces us to go out. And you can't, if you're gonna go out, you're gonna treat. Like that's one of the hard things that I, I've learned is it's like you can't take a call, go out somewhere and then not do anything. Like that's the absolute worst thing because somebody's taking the time to call, they feel like there's a situation, I can't report. Oh yeah, like we went out there, spent time, sent somebody out there and then they didn't do anything. Um, it's, so we end up treating at times where maybe we wouldn't have treated. Um, and then of course you take a singular location and then you think <laughs> to yourself, like if you're the driver, you're like, okay, well Rocky Hill is usually a problem but also says so Durham Road. So if I'm out here on Rocky Hill, I might as well do all of River Road, and then I got to cr cut across Hacker, so I might as well do Hacker, and then, I, then I'm at Durham Road, so I'll do all of Durham Road, right? So like suddenly what just turned into one problem area is the rest of the area gets treated, right? Um, it's, it's things like that. It's like, well, how do you, how do you get it into the mind of, of the driver? Like just treat what the issue was and, and don't try to forecast yourself while you're on the road you know, with, with material coming out of your back to, to just treat what you think might be a problem. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated process. Bottom line, we're trying to use less, always trying to use less. Um, and happy for questions for, for Josh or Sandy or myself. Other questions? Um, Councilor King. Thank you, um, Director Astle and, and uh, Mr. Katz and Mr. Stott for coming. I really appreciate um, your bringing our awareness to this issue. My well is around the corner from Mr. Katz as well, and I had no idea this was an issue I should be thinking about. Um, I am, I wondered if you, uh, I'm just thinking about the issue of people calling and, and um, I could anticipate that as salt is, use is decreasing, there will be people that, um, may call not even because there's actually a slipperiness happening but just because they're used to seeing a certain level of salt and now they're not and that that alone could be a concern so 
I'm just wondering um, if you've had conversations about what the best way or ways might be to get the word out to the public about what you're doing and, and why, um, just so we can maybe prevent or, or just make people more aware of the issue and, and also the explanations of why the roads might look a little different. Yeah, we have talked briefly about it. I mean, Sandy's got a pretty good um, forum from which he can reach people um, through the Times record. Um, we have the town website. Public Works has a Facebook page. Um, I, I think in general we want to get the word out, um, you know, just at least on the topic of cells so people are thinking about it. And um, I'm not sure that we've got to um, that level of detail where it's like, what, what are these particular messages? You know, that's a, that's a great example um, of, you know, people are used to seeing, I don't get it so much now, um, but definitely the last uh, couple of years when we switched over, everybody's used to seeing brown dirt, right, on the road, and that's a sign that the road's been treated. And so you, um, you know, you moderate your driving habits based on what you're seeing on the road, and then when you go to salt, it's very hard to see. And, and even our uh, drivers grapple with that. They, they look in the rearview mirror, and they don't see a trail behind them, and so it's hard to know that you just treated and to what degree you just treated. And same with um, with anybody driving on the roads. If you don't, if you're not seeing that, that visual cue that something's been applied to the road, the natural inclination is to think, oh, <laughs> public works again, they haven't done anything, right? And so I get those calls of you, you haven't treated. Um, and it's like, well, so we have technology, right? All of our trucks have GPS, and I know exactly where every truck has been and when they were there and how long they spent there and what they put down there. Um, so, I, like, I could go back and see, well, actually, yeah, we had been there three times in the last six hours, right? Every two hours. And, um, but, yeah, it's hard. Like, how do, you, how do you tell somebody? Certainly not in the heat of the moment, right? It's like, the <laughs> we're not going to convince them at that point, but it's, it's important, I think, to get out ahead of it and, um, to the best of our ability, sort of share some of these um, uh, you know, stories, examples, rationales for, for why we do what we do. If there's anything we can do as a council to help, please let us know. I'm thinking of uh, Councillor Watson in a possible TV3 spot. Yeah, sure. I could be the visual. Me and a shovel. It sounds good. Um, but yeah, please let us know because it does sound like an important public um, PSA that should be going out. Thanks. And just just a couple of um, additional thoughts to what Jay has said. When Josh and Jay and I started speaking, talking about this, we realized this was a multi-year effort. This was not something where you create a, a fact sheet and you just distribute it and everybody gets the word. This is going to take time. But we have a new environmental planner who has a lot of expertise with social media. Um, we'll write about it. We're going to create something called Salt Facts. And we'll work forward slowly. And as we do, and as we work on our watersheds in town as well, Mirbrook and McCoy watershed, that's an opportunity to talk about runoff as well. So they're not only pesticides and fertilizers, but there's salt runoff as well. And so there are a number of ways that we think we can address this, but it will take time. Okay. Councilor Walker. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jay. I have noticed the difference. You guys are doing a much better job, and you know, wish you we could get DOT in line. Um, <laughs> anyway, my question was the Brian solution you mentioned, is that the same or similar to what I believe Assistant Manager Lighten talked to the council about? God, it had to be four years ago now. That's magic minus. But yeah, that's yeah. The, the stuff you put on top of the salt so it works to lower. Okay, so we are using that, so the brine we, solution would be something different. We do the liquid, well, I'll let Jay explain. Okay. It. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, I know a little bit about it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, so Magic Minus is a magnesium chloride. Um, it's an additive. Um, so all, all of our trucks carry um, 90 or 100 gallon tanks. Um, and when the salt is coming out of, uh, at certain temperatures, we'll use it. Uh, when the salt's coming out of the hopper onto the spinner, um, it gets sprayed with um, this product called Magic Minus. It's um, uh, a molasses magnesium chloride. So it's got a brown color. Um, and that what that does, as town manager just said, is it lowers the um, uh, the freezing point of the water so that um, 
no, sorry, raises a, the melting point of it. So that um, you can use the salt at lower temperatures. Salt only works um, as a melting agent between 15 and 32 degrees. Um, once you get lower than that, um, it takes longer for it to, to work. And so if you add, um, add this, this product, um, it allows you to use the salt effectively to a lower temperature. Um, the brine that I was talking about is, is literally just a saline solution um, that is different from um, the, the hard rock salt, although it's the same product, just liquefied. Um, salt works when it's in solution uh, for melting ice. It doesn't, you know, you can't just take a piece of rock salt and set it on a piece of ice and it doesn't like melt a hole through it. It needs to have um, some liquid to, to get it to, uh, to act as a melting agent. Um, the brine, um, uh, the, the Amount of money to to mix our own brine um, to set up that system is is probably it's too expensive right now to consider. So that's why we're kind of doing this pilot project. We um, we can get brine from the DOT um, facility over in Topsom, um, and what we do is apply that um, that saline solution in liquid form um, on the roadway prior to a storm, and that prevents. Um, I think as uh, as Josh said it. What you're trying to do is prevent the bond of the packed snow from bonding with the road, because once it's done that, it's really hard to plow. You end up with slippery conditions because of the, that packed snow. Um, eventually, it will turn to ice, and it is a big, big pain in the butt to get rid of. Okay, Councillor Watson, then Councillor Wilson, then Councillor Shad. I think you answered my question, but I want to ask it again so you can elaborate a little further. There is an effective temperature range in which salt is applicable. And if it goes too low, it's, it becomes, it just, as you said, just sits there and becomes, and then it gets blown to the side, which is the reason for the nitric, uh, nitric solution. Is that correct? Yeah, the magnesium chloride, right. It, it, Excuse me, magnesium. Yeah. It allows the salt to work at a lower temperature than it does untreated. Yeah, I, I think it's important that people understand that just the application of salt is not necessarily the cure-all because it has an effective range of temperature, and if it goes below that range... Correct. Yeah, and I think, you know, this topic had come up, um, as Councillor uh, Walker had mentioned, um, when we were first talking about going over to this um, system in 2019, right? Magnesium chloride, any type of, type of chloride is bad for the environment, right? So no question about it. You're, that's why you're trying to limit the use of, of all of them to the lowest amount possible. Um, but unfortunately, and maybe it hasn't um, happened so much recently, aside from uh, this past weekend where we had really cold temperatures, but for most of this winter, right, we've been hovering 25 and above, um, and we haven't had to use much of the magnesium chloride um, for that reason, because the salt um, worked fairly well without it. Um, but yeah, as, as your temperatures get colder, the effectiveness as of just plain salt um, is, is drastically reduced. Councilor Wilson. Yeah, this is more of a comment <clears throat> than anything. I have a connection with Prince Edward Island, and I've been up there, uh, not in the last few years, but I've been up there several times in the winter, and I learned that they do not allow any salt on any of their roads because they're an island and they're a farming community. And so I remember one of the first things I was told when I drove over the bridge actually the ferry at that time, was to be careful because they don't, they simply don't allow salt on the roads. And um, that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> we're, we're kind of in Brunswick in itself is kind of an island with the river and the bays and everything else. So um, yeah, whatever you can do to, yep, that's all. Well, yeah, I guess I'd add on to that. Um, I, and I know it wasn't a question, but um, I, I do feel like we've sort of um, led ourselves kind of into this problem a little bit in terms of the level of service. Right? The better job we do having black pavement really quickly after a storm really works against us because net then, right, that's the expectation. And I definitely take a lot of those calls where um, if we haven't plowed a road, um, uh, you know, like every hour or they can't see 
black pavement out there, like in the middle of the storm, it's like, oh my gosh, like I can't go anywhere. And, you know, too back bad. when I was a kid, I, you know, we didn't, we just drove through it, right? Like it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> Council Shed. Uh, thank you very much for the balancing act that you obviously have to figure out every day between the, the safety and the environment. Um, my question is, um, have you done any looking at other cities and towns um, in the area that might be uh, a model for more aggressive limitations of, of uh, salt? And then my secondary question is, would you try to be more no salt in areas that were watershed or wells? And on, if you did go in that direction, would you use signage? I've seen places where it says no salt area, right. you know, to let people know that that's a little bit of a different area. So okay. three different questions you can handle in whatever, whatever way you want. Yeah, many of our um, neighboring, well, so uh, Maine DOT, the Department of Transportation, was at the forefront of going to salt priority. They've got 20 plus years of experience in this where, right, this is our our fourth year. Um, so we've taken a lot of information from them. Um, also in the uh, upper Midwest, um, a huge amount of research um, in, in terms of how to treat snow, um, you know, what's the best way to do it, how to reduce um, the chemicals that you're using to do that. Um, so plenty of literature out, th out there. I'd say the leading um, uh, strategy right now is, is using a liquid pre-treating system, uh, meaning you're putting down that brine, again, because you can um, you can formulate it so it's got the exact precise amount of salinity to it as opposed to um, we're just kind of guessing when we're putting the, the rock salt out on the road of trying to approximate you know that ideal 23.4% um, salinity. Um, if you're using the liquid system, you, you know exactly what you're putting out and right, that's the best way to, to minimize the amount of product that you're putting into the environment is, um, is using that technology. Um, it does cost a lot to get, we'd have to um, add equipment to all of our plow trucks to be able to apply a solution to it um, uh, or have a, an altogether different fleet of vehicles to be able to do that. Um, but that seems to be like kind of leading edge technology right now or, or um, kind of high end best management practice in terms of salt application. Um, and then what was, oh, uh, uh, low salt areas and, and no salt areas. Yeah, um, we've, uh, we've talked, me, uh, Josh and Sandy have talked about that, of can we have a kind of pilot project of a certain uh, couple of roads where we let everybody know that this is our, gonna be our strategy. Um, it's gonna look different. We're still gonna try to um, achieve a you know, s safe travel on the roads, um, but it's not gonna look like black bare pavement you know, from the beginning, middle, and end of the of the snowstorm, and um, yeah, w it's probably going to be in areas that have private wells. Um, it's going to be on roads that are predominantly flat, um, aren't uh, don't have curves in them, right? So someplace where it's um, it means less to be able to have um, you know, whatever 250 feet of stopping distance. Um, so we have talked about it, we just need to um, think through uh, kind of the logistics of that and, and how we would engage um, the residents in that area because um, they would definitely need to be on board. Um, it's not one of those things that's just going to be kind of command and control. We're going to do this um, because we think it's the right thing. It's, there's got to be buy-in. Are you looking from, for the council for any direction or is it just more of a encouragement and you're on the right track? Yeah, again, I think um, we just wanted to have this conversation um, so that people know that we're that we're talking about it, we're thinking about it, um, looking for uh, you know ways to improve. Um, it isn't just um, uh, you know willy nilly. We're throwing material out there with little regard to, to what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, um, sometimes I get calls that sort of imply that that is how we're doing things, and it just makes sense to, again, kind of in this forum and, and other forums, just have a, a a more broader conversation with the community about it. Okay. Councilor Watson. Just to satisfy my curiosity, I know uh, when my father was director of Public Works, where we got our salt from, the, I know that those mines have flooded. Where are we getting our salt from now? Um, let's see. Uh, it, it, 
I'll work backwards from our salt shed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it it gets man. trucked here from uh, from Portland. It arrives in Portland on barges. Um, it's arriving f uh, in Portland from, I think most of it actually comes from Chile, South America. Um, and the company that we uh, use um, is Morton. Surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> Great. Great. Well, thank you all for that presentation. Yeah, thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah that's good.